Hello, John, and welcome to Shana's uh, Mindset Lab podcast. I'm so, so happy to have you here. Thank you for finding time to talk to me about your business journey. Good morning, Roshana. Yeah, great to be here. Always keen to share and uh, hope that the listeners uh, will get something valuable and timely for them this morning. Wonderful. I'm sure they will do. So, John, you and I, we met uh, at Aston University when I was starting my PhD and you're starting your DBA. Um, and that was a fantastic experience, just having that wonderful mix of uh, people from traditional academic background and people from industry. Um, that was really nice. And then later when I did my coaching qualification, one of your books was um, one of the core reading for, for the coaching. And I thought, oh, I know this person. That's wonderful. So it's fantastic. I'm, I'm really happy that uh, you agreed to come and talk to us. Can I ask you uh, as a first question, just tell us a little bit about what you do and um, your business journey, how you started Yeah, so what do I do now? I'm the founder and CEO of a not-for-profit organization called The Trusted Executive. And The Trusted Executive exists to create a new standard of leadership defined by trustworthiness. So our belief is that the world right now leads, needs leaders who uh, rely on the power of trust rather than leaders who trust in power. So everything that we do and all the writing and speaking and coaching that I do is to try and build a tribe of leaders that share that passion, that want to stand up for that in the world right now and to practice together how we be the best trusted executives that we can be. So that's what I'm doing now. Um, in terms of where I started in my business career, I started at an organization called British Gas. Um, so British Gas sponsored me through my first uh, degree. I did a degree in chemistry at Nottingham University. And British Gas uh, sponsored me through that. And I joined the marketing department of British Gas after that degree. So between that starting point and now, there have been many twists and turns and ups and downs. But I feel very fortunate to have had a, a very interesting career in business. And I, and I love business. I love, uh, I think it's a, a never ending puzzle. And, and I love helping leaders who are passionate about um, leading in this new way. Wow, John, tell me how that happened with degree in chemistry, then you started in marketing. Mm. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I tell this story a lot, Rishana, that okay. back in those days, and we're talking, you know, a long time ago, um, <laughs> um, you got to remember things like emotional intelligence had not been invented in 1985. Mm -hmm. So really, all it was about when you did a degree, it was like, does he have a brain, you know, and, and, um, you know, I, I did a degree in chemistry, it was considered to be a good degree subject, you know, I wanted to do a degree in psychology, but it, I was told that it wasn't, you know, a real subject, because, you know, back in the day, that was, that was very new. Um, so, you know, so reluctantly, I did a, a science uh, subject, a, a traditional science subject, chemistry, and I ticked that box, you know, that, yeah, you know, intellectually, you know, you, you can tick that box. And, and that was really the key thing for organizations like British Gas at that time. That was the key criteria for joining their graduate scheme. And then they would put you in whatever function, you know, that they, uh, that they felt was, was most appropriate. So there were people that had degrees in Hebrew, people that had degrees in chemistry or English literature. And we were all in different functions of, of British Gas. So it, it was that was the way it worked, um, you know, back then. I mean, I think it's 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 changed a lot in many ways, um, but uh, that was that was how it all happened. Wonderful. And how did you find marketing aspects of business? Well, um, the particular part of marketing that I went into with British Gas um, was the customer service operation. And at the age of twenty one, I was given responsibility for looking after fifteen service engineers at the British Gas Depot in Coventry, which was notorious for its um, industrial relations uh, troubles over the years. So there I was as a very young, rocky, naive twenty one year old suddenly faced with some very experienced, wily um, service engineers, and and I was the boss, um, you know, of people who were twice my age and who knew the job inside out. Um, so that was a real baptism of fire. I mean, really, really, probably the most difficult job I've ever done, but, but it really uh, taught me a lot. You know, university taught me a lot about uh, 
you know, academic learning, but that was a different type of learning. That was about leadership. It was about human relationships. And it was about building trust, you know, with a group of people who were on paper very different to me, um, had, had had a very different path in life to me. But it taught me that, you know, at the end of the day, we're all human beings. And if you focus on uh, building that trust, then you can over time um, lead people. And I was really proud to to lead that group of, uh, of engineers for, for a period of time. But it was probably, yeah, the most difficult job I, I've ever done. I can imagine. Okay, so, and where you went from there? Well, I, um, I got the opportunity at British Gas to get involved with an IT project, uh, an IT project implementation, which again, it was like baptism of fire. I didn't really know much about IT projects, but you know, I went into that with an open mind and, and keen, keen to learn. And of course that exposed me to technology and IT. And obviously there was a lot going on, you know, uh, a lot of change was being, um, technology was a catalyst for a huge amount of change in business. And so it was a really exciting place to be. Uh, through that experience, I, I ended up working with a piece of software called SAP in the days when not many people knew about SAP. So I, I was fortunate to be on the sort of ground floor of this incredible boom in SAP uh, software implementation. And I was a project manager for that software, firstly with British Gas, then Cadbury Sweps. And then I joined a small consultancy that was specializing in SAP. And that was then a, you know, an incredible um, experience because it went from like 70 people to 440 people in three years. I, I became a director of that company and I got exposed to the entrepreneurial challenge. You know, I'd been in these big corporates with my pinstripe suits. And then all of a sudden I was in this crazy anarchic um, software consultancy full of bright people doing crazy things, but you know, really well. And uh, it was a real, again, different culture, different uh, style of leadership, learned a huge amount from uh, the people I was working with at uh, that organization, which was called Team One to One, a fantastic opportunity. And um, probably a game changer for me in terms of what you know everything else that happened in my career wow and what was the most challenging part in getting into that consultancy and then quite quickly as i understand becoming a director i think the biggest difference for me from going from that corporate world to the entrepreneurial world really was this difference between power and trust you know uh, in big co uh, corporations at that time you know you had a job title and you had authority to tell people what to do and by and large people respected that. But when you went into a, a very rapidly growing consultancy with very bright people who, who were being offered new jobs every day of the week, you know, they, 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 were, they, they were very much in demand. So it meant that the power dynamic between the leader and the follower was, was different. And I think I had to let go of a lot of corporate stuff that I'd, that I'd learned. And, and, and rely more on this trust to, uh, to, to lead people rather than power and authority. Um, so it, for me, it was a real defining experience to, to shed some of that corporate skin and get into that entrepreneurial world and, and realize that there were other ways of getting things done. There are other ways of leading people. And it really opened my eyes. And I, I was working with some very young leaders that the founder of the business, a guy called Ian Barker, was the same age as me at the time. So we're talking early 30s. He'd started this company in his kitchen, you know, around the table. And he'd never been on, he didn't have an MBA. He'd never been on any leadership development courses. But he was just naturally somebody that you wanted to follow. And, and, I, and I realized in hindsight, when I think about Ian now, he exhibited a lot of the habits of leadership that I later sort of came to sort of research and, and write about, but he was the one that just naturally had it. And uh, for people like me, it was, it was just fantastic to, uh, to, to be part of the team and to, uh, to, to follow him on that, on that journey. Wonderful. So with those leadership characteristics, um, maybe it's a tricky question, but and I'm sure you've answered this question many times before, but is it something we can all develop? Probably from, from Ian, uh, if I think of Ian, the thing that shocked me the most about Ian was his humility. Um, he was a man who had started a business from scratch, grown it very quickly, went on to become one of the richest people in the country because that business was sold for 86 million pounds in 1999. 
but but Ian, despite all of that and his in his obvious brilliance, was an incredibly humble person. And you would, for example, I remember going on flights with Ian, where we'd go on these long flights to projects in different parts of Europe, and you'd sit and talk to Ian, and he would pour out all his troubles and his concerns and his anxieties to you. And and he was the chief executive of the of the company. And, and I, I wasn't used to having chief executives pour out their heart to me, you know. Um, but I found it incredibly, um, it, it built a huge bond because, because you all, and it also gave you permission to, um, to take risks because you knew that Ian was not presenting himself as, as perfect. He wasn't he knew that he was had had things to learn, and it gave you permission to also um, think. Okay, well, if if Ian's like that, then I, and I know I'm like that because I know I've got a lot to learn. So, but he seems to be doing these things, so maybe I can do these things as well. And it was it was a very empowering, liberating atmosphere, and you saw people do things that they didn't believe they could do. And you know, I, I was the same as that. I led a project in Scandinavia for that organization for three years and I didn't when I first went out I, I didn't know what I was doing and I didn't think I could do it but but in the end it happened and we did it and that was the sort of environment it created was that people were going out of their comfort zones but they felt safe to do it because this style of leadership had given them permission to to fail really but um but on balance we didn't fail we we succeeded more often than we failed wow I love this idea of permission that's uh, quite powerful Okay, so what what did you do next after this then? Well, of course, uh, Logica acquired Team One to One in nineteen ninety nine, and say for eighty six million pounds. So it was a life changing moment for all of us, you know, in terms of we we had choices, you know. And uh, I, I woke up in a, a big corporate company, and having vowed never to work for a corporate company again in my life. Um, I, I suddenly turned up there again and um, the first two years were really difficult. Uh, um, we were all sort of locked in over that time, you know, so we, we sort of had to stay. And I was convinced that after two years I would, I would leave and, and get back into that entrepreneurial world. But I didn't. An opportunity came up to be international managing director in, in Logica. It was an opportunity to travel. Uh, I'd, I'd always been intrigued by international business and really in a large company like that that was the opportunity you you could you could um explore business in in all parts of the world and so this job international managing director was really attractive to me and um <clears throat> despite my misgivings about corporate life i did that role for for four years uh, and learned a huge amount and and really enjoyed it um but i always knew that eventually i would i would sort of start something more entrepreneurial. So uh, when I was 39, I left. Uh, a lot of people thought I was crazy to leave. My chief executive said to me, John, you know, you were on a very interesting career path. But I thought, no, it's it's not, it's your career path that I'm on. It's not my career path. So I wanted to start my own business. So that's what I did. Um, and I started a coach, an executive coaching practice with, with an Olympic rower, Olympic medalist rower called Bill Barry. And we were keen to look at what could the world of business coaching learn from the world of Olympic sports coaching. So for seven years, I, I went on that journey with Bill. Um, very different. Obviously, I'd, I'd got into coaching by this stage. Coaching for me was like technology in the 80s. It was, it was something new. It was changing very quickly. There, were, there was lots to learn. So, you know, for me, that was, that was great. You know, I just, I just wanted to soak it up and... Uh, and, and, and contribute as uh, what I could in, in that field. So, um, so that was the next chapter. It actually makes me wonder, um, so that ease with which you switch and you kind of go for entrepreneurial world, um, is that something you really wanted to do from start? Say, when you were little, do you have any entrepreneurs in your family? No, no, we don't, Shana. It's interesting. Well, I say we don't. My grandfather on my mother's side had a had a corner shop mm -hmm. in Bradford, um, and I must admit, I do remember spending a lot of time in in his corner shop um, eating eating sweets. Um, uh, but um, he he was he was he was a quiet entrepreneur, and maybe that did intrigue me a little bit. But I never sort of sat there thinking 
oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this one day. I never had any big sort of dream like that. But what happened to me as, as a kid was that I moved around a lot because my dad worked in the bank. Every two, three years, we moved house and I started a new school. Um, I had to, you know, leave behind all my, my, my friends and, and, and start again. And I think whilst at the time it happened, it wasn't great. I didn't really enjoy it. But it, it, uh, it gave me a lot of uh, adaptability. And it gave me a lot of confidence to do new things um, and to think that, you know, yeah, it's hard, but you you get there, you know, you get there. Things things eventually fall into place. So I think it gave me confidence to make changes, to start new things. And I think that's what I took into my career. And if you look at my career, that's what I've done. You know, every so often I'll, I'll, I'll sort of jump into something um, and I'm, I'm sort of backing myself, really, that I will I will adapt to it. I will. And, and, and I find it challenging and, 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 and interesting. Um, so I think that's probably where some of that comes from is, you know, from, from moving around a lot as a kid. Wow, this is very interesting. Okay, so how did that work out, bringing the idea from Olympic sport into the world of business? How did that develop? Yeah, it was, it was really, really interesting work. You know, we would take uh, executive leadership teams in a an eight as they call them you know a, a rowing uh, boat for eight on the thames uh in henley uh, with olympic athletes uh, and give people an experience and then we would debrief that you know to see where where are the parallels between leading a business and uh and and leading or, or winning a race you know in in rowing and uh, you know through that i got to know many of the olympic rowers it, it also got me into uh, that sports world so since that time i've had the pleasure to work with England cricket team, um, a number of Team GB sports teams, so the, the diving team, the, the Paralympic shooting team, um, and premiership football clubs, you know, so that whole sports world opened up to me and became really interesting as a field of performance and, you know, what, what can we learn from that? And, and I've learned a huge amount myself and a lot of my writing has been inspired by that work in the sports field and, and bringing it back into, into business and trying to put it into that business context. So yeah, it, it just, uh, Bill, you know, uh, say introduced me to, to, to that, to that world. And it's a world that I'm still part of today. And, um, you know, feel, feels a real privilege to, to, to work in that, in that field. Wow. This is so interesting. I wonder though, is there anything that is possible to take from business world and, kind of send it into or introduce it into the sporting world? What do you think? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. It's a two-way street. I mean, for example, one of the things that I think business is really good at that sports people typically aren't as good at is strategic thinking. Uh, if you think about an athlete, um, they're, they're focused on the race uh, and winning the race. There's a lot of tactics. There's a lot of technique. Um, but when they look over a longer period of time, you, you need to have strategic thinking to develop a sport over a period of time. Um, so sports are often rushing from one race to the next, from one game to the next, and they're not stepping back and looking at, at, at it strategically. I think some of the challenges we've seen in football at the moment it is there's been a lack of strategic thinking, you know, around how football is going to develop. And, and at some point, you know, that will that that is an issue um, and is becoming an issue. So I think business leaders typically are better at strategic thinking, and and they can bring a lot of that into the sports world. So yeah, definitely works both ways. Mm. Okay, and you already mentioned that idea of um, writing your book. So can you tell us how you arrived at that? So the trusted executive—that's the name, isn't it? Well, the trusted executive is is the the latest book the that I wrote book. yeah but in, I mean interestingly I have I have the three books here that two two of which people know about but well, not not everybody knows about but you know two of which are publicly available one was self-published so the first book um that I dared to write with with Ian Day was a self-published book which was called um where were all the coaches when the banks went down oh and we wrote that after the global financial crash in 2008 2009 mm. um and so that was the first step into that world of writing books. And again, I was starting from zero. You know, you don't know whether you can do it. it it's scary, but it's also exciting. 
Um, but, you know, through writing that book, it's a long story, but we got the opportunity to convert that book into a, a mainstream published book, which 2012 Challenging Coaching came out. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, that was a proper book, um, if you like. Um, and Challenging Coaching is now 10 years old and is still selling well, which is which is quite amazing. And, you know, Ian and I would would never have expected that back in 2012. And then. As you mentioned, I started the DBA when you started your PhD at Aston. And the goal there was about writing a, um, a book that was academically grounded. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the Trust Executive, which came out in 2016. Uh, that was the book that came out of that research. So book writing for me has been like, um, like everything else in my career. It's about starting from the bottom, learning, uh, gradually sort of building um, over a period of time always looking to uh, make the next one that little bit better or, you know, uh, just, just that that's the sort of um, cycle, if you like, that I like to, uh, to be on. So, so the book, the book writing bit has been, yeah, uh, again, just a, a wonderful experience um, to, to have. And, you know, it's, it's a joy when people mention your books to you or, or you happen to, get an email from somebody in South Africa who says, oh, I read your book and on page 15, you said this. And I'm thinking, did I? I can't, I can't even remember writing that. Um, so these are the little moments, you know, that, that make all the hard work of, of writing books very worthwhile. So if people are listening, I, I would, you know, people, a lot of people have a dream about writing books, you know, and uh, that was my dream. And, um, you know, again, it's, you know, if I can do it, then, you know, why not? You know, um, it's, it starts small, but, but over time, you can you can make progress in that direction, and it's it's worth it. How long did it take you to write your first book? Um, but all books, all those three books, typically took a year um, to write. Now, I mean, obviously, you're thinking about these books for longer than a year. I mean, the trusted executive. I was thinking about that book from probably 2011. And I didn't start writing it until 2015. So there's a whole thought process of like gestation of ideas and thinking, thinking, thinking um, about something, uh, digging and digging. And, and then you get to a point where you think, right, now I'm ready to write. But, and, and when I'm ready to write, I can, I can then write, you know, and it will come quite quickly. But all of that thinking has had to have happened, you know, before I start writing. And I mean, I'm thinking about, my next book now oh. like even even as we talk right there's part of my brain that is thinking about my next book because all the time it's like it's going okay you know maybe something's happening here that could be relevant you know and and, and I know there's something going on in the back of my mind which I'm hoping will will then you know prompt me to to start writing again and I don't know whether that will be in two months time or in two years time, it, it, it doesn't work like that. It's not like I can just say, go, let's do it now. But one day I know I'll wake up and it'll be right. Okay, we're ready now. And I'm, I'm gonna start writing. And I, I think that's one of the joys of writing is it's it's very, um, uh, it's, a, it's a weird old process. It's not logical. It's, 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 it's a, there's a little bit of magic in, in all of that, which, you know, is, is, is lovely when you sort of uh, feel like it's there and you can, tap into it i really like that attitude that there's a bit of magic because it is a creative process isn't it and i think to a lot of people who are considering or at some point in the future will be considering to write a book not to confuse this process of um, thinking about it with procrastination so it's, a it's a brilliant point Roshana. it's a really great point I think a lot of people probably do make that or are hooked by that thought that they're just delaying, that this time is just a delay. Um, I mean, obviously there are times, there are moments when it can be procrastination, but, but there are also moments when no, it's, 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 it's the right thing to be doing. You're dwelling on something, you're, you're waiting for inspiration um, you're doing your research. I mean, you, you've done a PhD and you know, it's a bit similar with, with PhDs that you you have to read a huge amount and think a huge amount and you and you don't even know what it is that's going to come from all of that but you're waiting for something to start to crystallize out and then you go right that's it I've got it but it but that moment when it comes can be 
it can happen. I, in my experience, you, you, you typically have to um, be patient and um, and do the reading, do the thinking, not 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 thinking that's a waste of time or procrastination. It's 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 creating the conditions for inspiration. And um, when that comes, then when you've got it, yeah, don't don't wait once you've once you've had it. But you need to you need to have it. And I, I was watching a documentary last night about the Rolling Stones and Keith Richards and writing music. And you know, as you say, it's a creative process. You, you can hear people talking about it in the same way. You know that you can't just sit down at a piano and knock out you know a, a, a number one hit you know it, it's it's a process that needs time needs inspiration and you have to um again i think be a bit humble that it comes from somewhere at, at a time of its choosing and uh, you just got to be listening and ready and and uh, to, to to hear it did you have any aim in mind was there like to 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 write a bestseller or something that would you know take that would make me millions or something like this did you have any aims uh with book writing um with book writing the aims have changed over time so the the, the self-published book was can we do this you know the aim is just oh, let's let's produce a book and we don't mind if nobody reads it let's just demonstrate that we can actually do this you know so that was the aim of the first book the second book, Challenging Coaching, which was, you know, a mainstream published book, it was a little bit similar, really, because, you know, we're in a different league at that point. And you're thinking, well, let's just prove that we can do it and get and get the book out there. So there wasn't some huge expectation around writing a number one bestseller. I think with Trusted Executive, um, the aims are different. I wrote that book on my own. The, the first two books were written with Ian. So I did have a name to to do something on my own and have my own voice and, and the freedom to sort of speak totally from my own voice um, and my own research. Um, so again, the aim was to, to get the job done. Um, when you think about sales of books and making money from books and things like this, I mean, I think that those are very dangerous uh, motivations uh, because, you know, <laughs> who knows? I mean, you just don't know when you start these projects who's going to be interested the, the the real question is are you interested you know are you sufficiently interested in it that you want to write you want to get something out there and you just have you know you have that inner motivation i think if you if you link it too hard to to these extrinsic unpredictable factors like you know how much how many copies you sell in what how much money will you make things like that i think that's a very fragile basis to uh to do um, uh, writing a book, a bit like doing a PhD. I mean, you know, again, I think you probably have that experience that it's hard, you know, you need a lot of stamina, you need a lot of resilience. And I think that level of motivation comes from something other than just, I want, I want to earn more money or I want to sell X books. I think it's about passion and, um, you know, that you have something in you that you just think, yeah, I, I, I've got to, I've got to get this out into the open and that's its own motivation curiosity isn't it curiosity yeah curiosity um, Einstein's quote was that I have no great gifts I am only passionately curious I love that uh, and I love that you know yeah. you know be passionately curious what are you passionately curious about because if you tap into that that's where you might write a book and that's the motivation to go for as you say curiosity is the motivation for for these things you know what is out there you know what could be possible it's it's all curiosity rather than um expectation mm, yes it's really interesting okay so fast forward to today then and the trusted executive on this one uh it's a foundation as well isn't it yeah. i have two questions first what how did you arrive at this name and I really, really like that, the combination of it and, and the meaning behind it. And second, why foundation? Yeah, okay, now you've got me thinking here now, the name, the trusted executive. Ah, I know where that came from. I didn't actually create that name. The book originally, the title I had for the book was Building Tomorrow's Leaders, I think it was, Building Tomorrow's Executive Leaders. Mm -hmm. But then Kogan Page, the publisher, said to me, we can't have a book about trust that doesn't have the word trust in the title. Mm. And they said, 
um, how about the trusted executive? And uh, it's interesting because I was quite attached to the original name because you do get attached to, to those things. So it took me a while to sort of, you know, get over the fact that I was gonna, you know, thinking of changing it. Um, but I'm glad that I did. And actually I've forgotten about it until you asked me the question, but that's where the trusted executive came from. It came from the publisher. And sometimes, you know, sometimes they, they know what they're doing. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, you, you, you're best to listen. Um, so that's where the trusted executive came from. Now the foundation bit, um, yeah, you asked about motivation earlier and, um, you know, writing books, uh, things like that, you know, and so there I am at like, you know, so this is uh, six years ago. So what I'm 52 at this point, right? So I'm thinking, and people are going to me, oh, you should start a business based on the trusted executive. And I'm going, why? Why would I do that? You know, why would I go back into starting from scratch again on something else? Because I'm not looking to have a yacht in France. I'm not looking, you know, it's, it's not, it's not, you know, I'm thinking, no, it doesn't, that doesn't really work for me as motivation. You, you know, your word curiosity. I'm not curious about that stuff. Mm. I'm not sufficiently curious about that stuff anymore. Um, and then somebody um, said to me, well, you could make it a charity. And at that point, I got curious because I hadn't done that before. And um, I didn't know how to do that. So it sort of hooked me in terms of, Mm, how would you do that then and why would you do that and so the foundation is you know, we have this mission to gift a million pounds to uk-based christian-led charities that are inclusive at the point of need um now that mission and we're, and we're quarter of a million pounds into that mission after after sort of five years um so we've got a long way to go but but we're on the we're on the mark you know we're sort of there we're on the mountainside sort of a quarter of the way up and um but that statement is sufficient to motivate me to to do the hard work you know that that's involved and um you know i i'm a, I'm a christian so I have a, I have a faith so it taps into my it taps into my faith uh, it taps into you know what i believe in in terms of business around giving back and a more a more inclusive vision for business success in the 21st century so it does walk in the talk really of of the book and, and everything else so that's that's why the foundation part of it is important because without that I wouldn't have uh, thought it was worthwhile to even start you know and thankfully we did start and you know we we, we are where we are and um, hopefully we'll um, we'll continue to make progress towards that goal really meaningful and uh, yeah, it's it's very interesting to know that. Uh, thanks for sharing. So, what does the future hold then for John Blakey? Hmm. Well, <laughs> <laughs> who knows? Um, you know, as I said, I have faith, so um, you know, I put myself in the hands of God, and and um, I let God sort of decide. But um, what am I available for? You know, if, if, if you know, God willing, um, you know that, that that God gave blessing to it, then. Um, I, I would like to write some more, but I, I would I would like to write more overtly about my faith, the role my faith has had in my life, um, the, the impact it has, you know, in leadership, and um, you know that 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 would be something really interesting to sort of explore and share. Um, even as I talk about it now, it scares the living daylights out of me. But that's also an indication of yeah, could be interesting um, path. So I think, yeah, writing some more, I'm, I'm currently um, studying, I mean, like, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a lifelong addict to qualifications and learning. I'm studying at Oxford University at the moment and doing a theology um, qualification, which, which may in time lead to a, a degree in theology. And that's part of me wanting to play more of a leadership role in, in the church and um, to speak and to preach and um, you know to do, do all of that you know so so i think you're probably picking up that the future for me hopefully will be um more focused on my faith and um you know really uh, bringing bringing all the experience i i have and to, to that world it's another world like the world of sport the world of business the world of faith is it's just another world uh, but for me it's a really important world and one that i would still love to make a a contribution to 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, John. My last question. So we talked about, uh, you mentioned passionate curiosity and just being open-minded um, and a lot of other very interesting things. So my last question is about um, any advice, any additional advice that you can give or you'd like to share with someone starting out, perhaps from you know a chemistry degree or an engineering degree and who is interested in to go into the world of entrepreneurship? Yeah, I think the advice would be that we live in a time now where never has it been so possible to, to try new things and to explore new fields. Um, you reminded me of a, a, a quote from a guy called um, Dr. David Hall. David Hall said, um, most of us are slowly bleeding to death in the world of what is. Um, but could we think about um, jumping from that place to the world, the, the exploding possibilities of the world that might be um, you know, so I think th there is an exploding world of possibilities out there. And sometimes you're, you're living in the world of what is. You look back on the line and you think, well, the line's a straight line and it's just going to carry on into the future. And, and it's like, no, it doesn't have to be a straight line. Uh, exploding possibilities are not straight lines, you know, and um, I think we live in a time where there are lots of exploding possibilities. And, it, and it, if you are willing to, to, to make that jump, take, take, take a risk. Um, most of these times when we take risks, we, we, we spend a lot of time thinking about what could go wrong. Um, and I'm just wanting to encourage people to think about what could go right, mm. you know, because sometimes it does go right. And obviously sometimes it goes wrong, but let's at least spend time thinking about both because it's exciting to think about what might go right. It inspires people, it, it motivates people. And I do think that, you know, there's, for, for, for people starting off, yeah, how about thinking about, wow, what could go right if I did this? And um, get into that exploding possibilities mindset. Because in my experience, um, there's, there's a lot out there that, um, that you could leave unexplored if you, if you didn't sort of knock on the door. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Really inspiring journey. Thank you very much for coming and, uh, and sharing it with, with me and with the listeners. Thank you, John. Thank you, Thank you Roshan. It's been a pleasure.